everyone, and thank you for joining today. I am Robin Lyons, ISACA's IT Audit Professional Practices Principal. I'd like to extend a welcome to our guest, Steve Jackson, IT Audit Manager at Airbnb. So thank you for joining us today, Steve. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So Steve has uh, recently written an article for ISACA, and the, the article talks about auditee buy-in, a key component of audit effectiveness. So uh, before we actually jump into that topic, Steve, can you share a little bit about how you got into audit? Yeah, no, thanks for having me again. Um, enjoy writing the article. Uh, excited to be here today to kind of talk through some of the, the points uh, in the article. Um, as far as my career getting started, uh, I would say back in 2010, uh, like it was like my second job out of college. Um, I got my first taste uh, of audit. I worked at a company called Accenture. And uh, I worked on a client where we were doing some continuous monitoring. And so essentially uh, every quarter uh, we would have uh, uh, various areas that we would look at for that company. Uh, things like, you know, um, access reviews. Uh, if it was uh, time to do like a policy review, uh, we would just go in and, you know, check that those things had occurred. So uh, again, like very small scale kind of uh, first taste. It wasn't until uh, 2013 uh, when I started working at KPMG uh, where I began uh, as a, a senior auditor, uh, senior associate, excuse me, there um, doing external audits for various uh, government clients. And so I've uh, been in audit ever since, uh, external, internal, and yeah, I think probably here to stay. Fantastic. That's great. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump into our discussion today. And I believe that for those who've been in the industry for a while, they have some familiarity with um, auditee buy-in and, and some sort of concept of, of what that is. Um, but for those who are newer, and also to make sure that we are uh, talking the same language here today, Steve, can you share with our listeners um, a working definition of auditee buy-in? Yeah, for me, auditee buy-in is really when you have the full cooperation from leadership down um, all the way to the the key stakeholders, the uh, persons you know, persons of interest that that you're talking to, um, and that you're able to um, have open dialogue. Uh, they are providing you with uh, thorough, detailed information when you're uh, going through your different interview questions, providing you with evidence, um, and and again, really just kind of comes back to that that full cooperation. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for that. So setting the stage with that. Um, I kind of wanted to talk to a little bit about um, experiences in audit. And I think audit is like any other profession where we will have uh, memorable encounters or um, uh, instances that sort of stick out in our memories. I'm trying to avoid saying war stories because we don't want to associate audit with anything like a, like a war story. Mm -hmm. But um, in your experience, have there been any common themes um, that you've noticed in audits from both the perspective of the auditee as well as from the auditor? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, I mean, there's so many, right? But from an auditor perspective, I would say uh, a common thing, theme, excuse me, um, that I've seen, um, and I, you know, it's happened to myself as well early on in my career, um, and that would be not either requesting pre-read information uh, like policies ahead of time or or any type of run books that the team or organization may have. Um, so one, not requesting them, and then more importantly, uh, not doing like a thorough read of those documents. Um, a lot of times getting that information ahead of time, uh, like I say, having a thorough read of it will help you have a better conversation when it comes time to do a walkthrough. Um, you've gotten an understanding of some of their processes. And then rather than waste their time, you, you know, asking them, okay, tell me about your process. You kind of already know how the process works and you're able to more so not poke holes into the process, but ask specific questions as it relates to the process uh, based on your understanding. So that's a common theme I've seen uh, from, from an audit per auditor perspective. Um, from an auditee perspective, I would say um, probably more so on the external side. Um, it, it happens on internal as well, but um, just not providing uh, detailed responses sometimes in interview questions. Uh, I wouldn't say withholding information, but just being very careful uh, about the answers and responses that you give the auditor uh, because, you know, 
in, in most cases, they're worried that, um, you know, you're going to find something or, um, you know, call out something that they might be doing wrong or not doing. And so a lot of times uh, the auditee can be uh, hesitant, especially in the beginning when you never work with those individuals to provide, um, you know, detailed information. Right, right. Very good. Thank you for that. Uh, just to go off track a little bit, I'll share one of my most memorable memorable experiences as an auditor. I was uh, conducting an inventory in West Virginia at a mining site. And so to do the inventory, we were looking in the warehouse, you know, different, you know, nuts and bolts, those sorts of things. So as we walked in, the auditee, there's a, there was a sign posted on this door said, Copperhead loose in the warehouse. And I looked at him, I said, you're kidding me, right? There's not a Copperhead in this warehouse. The guys are just playing a joke, right? You know, ha, ha, ha. He says, no, ma'am, I saw it go in the warehouse myself. I posted the note. And so oh, wow. sensing my discomfort, uh, he says, you know, I know that your inventory has to be objective and you have to count these things yourself. But as we're going, pulling these bins off the shelf, he said, I would rather find that thing than you. So what he did was he would actually take the, the uh, bins off the shelf. I would count them and he would put them back on the shelf and he did the entire inventory that way with me. So um, something that stands out as an auditor and that is that is uh, stayed in my brain is, is that actual experience. So. Yeah, well, I snakes are probably like one of the, the main like reptiles that I'm not a fan of. So <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure I would not have been able to uh, continue with that audit and they would have had to call someone else to finish that. <laughs> um, so I think too, when we think about the audit process, Steve, a lot of time we talk, we think about in terms of um, the actual planning. And as part of that, we think about uh, maybe staffing as an example. Do we have the right number of resources to participate on the audit? Do we have people who have uh, the right skills or the, the level of proficiency that we need to conduct the audit? Um, but there's more actually to that, and you and you pointed that out very well in your audit, in your article, and that's talking about the other parts of an audit, and that's the relationship part of the audit. So, can you talk a little bit today about? And I know it's just one element, but I think it's an important element, and that's trust. And can you share with us um, your ideas on how auditors can actually establish and maintain trust? Yeah, um, I would say like when it comes to trust, everyone not I won't say everyone, but um, it's common to know that trust takes time, right? You, you don't, you know, automatically go into a relationship trusting someone. And sometimes you do sometimes have the philosophy where, you know, I'm going to trust you until you break my break, break, uh, you know, your trust. Um, other times it's, you know, sh you know, you have to show me um, that I can trust you. And a lot of times that's how it is in audit. You have to establish that trust. Um, and really you just do that by, you know, having a good rapport with the auditee. Um, you know, having open dialogue, uh, in my experience, uh, it's been best whenever um, you hear the auditee's concerns when it comes to things like timeline, you know, when you want to conduct the audit compared to when that team can support the audit um, and having, um, you know, the bandwidth to uh, move your audit uh, slightly and, and just kind of adjust your schedules. Uh, doing small things like that, it, it generates, like I say, that good rapport. Um, and and kind of goes to uh, the working relationship. Um, and then in order to like maintain that trust over time, it just you know comes with being consistent. Um, and, you know, when I worked at Verizon, uh, we had began working with one of the um, product groups out of out of Atlanta, and uh, we were able to come back constantly every six months or so doing different types of audits. Um, but it was only because we had created that good rapport, had a good relationship with them, and we consistently showed them not only were we providing value to them uh, based on the audits that we were doing and some of the recommendations we had, um, but we had a good working relationship with each other. They could trust us to know that we weren't going to come in and just kind of point the finger uh, at everything that might be going wrong um, and more so come with, with recommendations on how we can improve the current control environment. Fantastic. Excellent. Excellent recommendations and tips. So, so thank you for those, Steve. So leveraging off that and building a little bit, um, do you have any guidance or, or suggestions on how we can work to improve relationships if we're working with an auditee who, who potentially has had um, a not stellar or, or a, a poor experience with the audit function in the past? And sometimes it doesn't even have to be that particular auditor. It doesn't even have to be that particular company, but they feel like they've gotten you know burned 
by audit in the past. And so they sort of carry that into their relationships with the audit function. Um, in those cases, do you have some additional tips that, that could help um, help our listeners? Yeah, I've actually experienced that. Um, and, and that's common, you know, especially in audit. Like a lot of people automatically look at audit or an auditor uh, as the bad guy. Like you're just coming here to, you know, say what I'm doing wrong and be on your way. And so it's a lot harder on the external side. Uh, my experiences have been on the internal side where, um, it, you know, individuals have that poor perception if you will, of audit. Um, and there was a situation um, where uh, basically they kind of walked through the fact that uh, an auditor had came there before. And as I kind of mentioned before, I just kind of called out things that they were doing wrong. They didn't really provide any, any recommendations. And so what we did in that case was, you know, really just kind of took a step back saying, hey, this is what we're here to, to look at. This is here where we're looking at to, to assess. Um, and based on our assessment, we're not just going to hand you this report and be on our way. You know, we're more so like coming to you from a, uh, a audit, but also an advisory perspective. And so we're here to you know provide recommendations and and like actions uh, into what you can do to to you know improve your control environment. We can't implement the controls for you, but we can uh, be specific um, and, and detailed about what type of steps it is that you can take to improve whatever control it is that might be um, uh, more of a, a risk right now to you or a gap in your organization. Right, right, fantastic, fantastic. So so up to this point, Steve, we've talked about things that the auditor can do to sort of build and to maintain this relationship. So if we look at, look at it from the auditee's perspective, are there any behaviors or any things, uh, outward signs that the auditor can observe in the auditee that gives the auditor confirmation that all these steps that, that you've recommended that the auditor has taken, that they're actually working? Yeah. Um, another good question, Robin. Um, I would say for me, the first thing is, um, are you getting responses, <laughs> right? Like, you know, from the beginning, uh, is the auditee responding to your request? Whenever you have meetings, are they asking questions? You know, is it a silent call where, you know, it's like one way um, dialogue, uh, we're not even dialogue, right? It's one way, so there is no dialogue, um, you know, and are, based on the kind of questions that they're asking, are they questions that are generic or is it specific to the materials that you're, you're uh, sharing or, or um, you know, providing? And so for me, that would be the first thing is, you know, do you have any type of active communication? Uh, the other thing is like, as you're going through the audit, um, you know, are they again, providing you with information um, that is helpful? You know, do they understand, um, you know, what you're requesting? I know we're talking about the auditee, but a lot of times the auditor can um, at times not do a good job of, you know, explaining ultimately what it is you're looking to to see. You know, a lot of times we have auditors, we have this script of, you know, I need X, Y, Z. You know, do you have that? And uh, for the business, especially, you know, like in my world now working at Airbnb, it's not going to be, um, you know, from like a government perspective, you have this access control policy. It, it might be named something different, right? It could be, you know, this is our identity uh, and access management procedure document, or this is our identity access management policy. And so even calling a document one specific name can throw the auditee off. Um, and so you have to be um, open to how you, you know, communicate what it is that you're looking for. Uh, but going back to just that communication and how the auditor can see that the auditee has that communication or that communication is, is effective. Um, I think like I say, is having uh, clear signs that um, they're listening, that they hear what you're saying, they hear what you're asking for, um, and they're providing like active responses uh, specific to, to that. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, and I'll share too, from my work experience, um, working with different groups, I think I really felt that I turned a corner in my relationships with groups, when they started to actively reach out to me and say, well, we are aware that there's this new, you know, regulation in our industry. What do you think about that? When they started to come to me and ask questions about, well, what do you think about it? How do you think that's going to impact um, our particular organization? Um, and that's what I really felt like, you know, I've, I've sort of, you know, developed some level of trust with the groups that I was actually auditing. So that that may be another another area, too. 
Yeah, no, I've seen that as well, right? Like after you, you know, work with the group, um, you know, for quite some time, even if it's not necessarily a long time, but, you know, you work with a group, you did one audit and they saw how valuable it was and saw the value that you brought to that team and to that organization. Um, and yeah, I know even now, like our group, we get a lot of requests of, you know, sitting in on, on different integrations that are, or, you know, migrations that are going on because they trust, you know, and, and respect the value that we bring to the organization. Um, but like you said, that only comes from, from trust. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so can we talk a little bit, because this is such something that's such on the forefront of, of everyone in the industry, um, we hear a lot about the skills gap. Um, we hear a lot about innovation and digital transformation. So from that perspective, um, how can auditors achieve buy-in from a confidence perspective when they're working with groups so that the, the groups feel comfortable that the auditors are proficient, that they are current, um, on the things they need to be current on and proficient in to do an audit, given that that changing landscape that we have. Yeah, I think the thing I think about, regardless of the technology, when you are thinking about IT audit um, and the controls, a lot of the controls that you need to have in place are the same. You know, it's just a matter of applying that um, control or, or implementing, shall I say, that control to a different uh, type of technology. And it's like, okay, well, how do I do that for this technology compared to, you know, a, another technology? Uh, the way I've done that in the past is, uh, again, trying to do my reading, you know, the pre-reads, doing my own research on uh, new technologies. There was a, a, an example um, when I was uh, at an organization in the past where we were auditing a um, an application and we were, I think we were looking at access controls um, and the auditee, you know, was like, okay, well, I know you guys want us to, you know, be able to pull this information, but, you know, I, I don't know how to do that. And so I took it upon myself to uh, look up some information about the tool, um, how things were configured and see if there is a way, whether it um, be an API or script that they could pull down that information. And I was actually able to find that information just by doing my own research, um, you know, out on the web uh, to see, you know, how, how we could go about testing that area. And so those are the types of things that the auditee has to do to show the um, excuse me, that the auditor has to do to show the auditee um, that they're taking the time upon themselves to, you know, try to make sure they're up to speed on the latest uh, technology uh, and specifically the technology area that they're auditing. Um, because, yeah, to your point, Robin, like technology changes every day. Um, you know, crypto is a big thing right now. And so like understanding, OK, how do you audit this space? You know, you have to take it upon yourself as an auditor to to do trainings. LinkedIn, I know they offer a, a lot of um, different trainings uh, and certifications that you can get. You know, our courses, uh, 30 minute courses just to, to bring yourself up to speed uh, and then being able to show the auditee that you've taken that extra time to do that will go a long way. Absolutely. Absolutely. It does. Um, so I think uh, you've given us a lot of tips um, and, and guidance on how trust and communication and collaboration and auditor preparedness, um, I'll, I'll lump that into one big bucket. Um, yeah. So with, with all of those things, can you share what attributes and what description you would provide for an effective audit? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a lot, right? Because like I say, you know, it's so many, you know, we have the, you know, four different areas of an audit from from planning all the way to, uh, you know, reporting and post post audit. Um, but I would say from the beginning, uh, in the planning stages, you have active communication with the auditee, you're the, the auditor is doing um, their own research and understanding of the areas of the team or organization that they're auditing. Um, throughout that audit, you're getting that active communication from the auditee and from the team. You have buy-in from the top to the bottom. Um, you know, a lot of times we talk about that buy-in and you may have the buy-in um, of the, um, you know, senior or manager of the team it is that you're auditing, but do you have the buy-in of the executive level? Do you have the buy-in of the directors? And so having that 
uh, buy-in from the top to the bottom uh, is, is a major component to having an effective audit. Um, and then once you've gone through that audit, you know, making sure that everyone's on the same page of any uh, findings or recommendations that your team may have for the auditee uh, and that, you know, there's not any major pushback and that, you know, it's understood on the auditee's side of you know, the next steps, what needs to be done. Uh, you have buy-in on those findings, on those recommendations. Uh, and then I think from there, uh, you know, that's the audit is essentially over and you would have, like I say, you know, got that uh, at least kind of warm and fuzzy as if you will that, you know, okay, this, this was a good audit. Everyone is like on the same page um, and you're able to then from there, from there go uh, the next the next year or the next couple of months uh, and, and maybe work with that team on on a different area uh, or when it comes back around you know a year or two years later you might be auditing in the same area uh, you would have built that trust with that team you would have had a good rapport uh, and and they would then kind of speak to other teams about you you know that would be the ultimate goal uh, that you would want to uh, kind of reach for. Fantastic. That that's that's fantastic. Appreciate the, those thoughts and 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 the, those recommendations. Yeah. So, Steve, I think you brought together a lot of information for us today, and thank you for doing that. Unfortunately, this is all the time that we have today to talk about this topic. Like you said, we can go on and on because there there are different considerations that we can we can think about, and also uh, different uh, memorable instances that we've had that we can share. But uh, but we do have to wrap up for today. Um, for our listeners, if you're interested in um, reading Steve's full article, and uh, please check that out. Um, it's an Isaka article entitled Audity Buy-In, a Key Component of Effective Audits. And you can find that in the, the click the link below uh, to, to access the article. Um, and again, Steve, thank you uh, for your time today. Really appreciate it. Um, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, thanks for joining and I'll see you next time. Thank you.